great service this morning, had a great time. Although I will say I got a little nervous whenever y'all hit the last verse of that second song this morning and the choir went up. I thought we was going to handshake, and so I about took off the aisle greeting everybody, and I saw y'all heading towards the choir. I was like, okay, I better stay put, stay where I'm at. But uh, it, we've had a great time. Very thankful for your hospitality and for allowing us to be here. So as uh, Brother Poindexter is already saying, my name is Jed Biddy, and I'm a missionary to the country of Mexico, specifically working with national pastors. Now, how does that work? Um, what I do is I spend the majority of my time here in the States going to different churches, raising the funds, and sharing needs of the national pastors here stateside. And once a church falls under a burden, or several churches falls under a burden to start a work in Mexico, we then go through the process of vetting one of the national pastors and then begin supporting them for three and a half years. Once we give that that man that support and he knows it's going to be for three and a half years, he immediately begins working a lot of times in his home. We have had several churches that we've gone to where they're meeting in the living room of their home. We had 40, 50, 60 people and we was packing in there like sardines, but we had a time of our lives, had a great time just in the things of the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And after that three and a half years, that man is now ready to step out, be fully independent in his church, and we help him build his first building. And uh, we, me and Brother Poindex talking about last night, he said, how much does it cost to build a building down in Mexico? And I say $10,000, in which here in the States you could barely buy the, a bundle of plywood for $10,000. But down there you can... You know, have a fully furnished church that can sit about 120 people. And so we help them and assist them in building that church. Then we turn the keys over to the pastor, and we just keep them accountable. We have a, a conference that so we have all the pastors come in, and we meet with them, and uh, we assist them in any way that we can. One of the areas that I also work in is in gospel literature. I work with Fellowship Track League, uh, Bearing Precious Seed, also work with Publisher Parish in Gulfport, Mississippi. All these different resources we pull together to be able to supply the Word of God all throughout the country of Mexico. Whenever I was 13, I took my first trip down to Mexico. Whenever I got back, I raised the money to send down 12 million tracks. They say that one gospel track will be read by approximately four different people. Now, that might be one track is thrown in the garbage and another track is read by 12 different people. But on average, they say about four people in the country of Mexico will read a single gospel track. 12 million tracks, that's 48 million people that had the opportunity to read the gospel as a result of that ministry. Since then, we've sent down several more containers, getting another container ready to send down now. And one of the reasons that the Lord pierced my heart to start this work in Mexico and to work in the country of Mexico is because whenever I went down there and I saw the need, I saw somebody hear the gospel for the very first time and a huge smile lit upon their face because they knew this is what they had been searching for. They had been searching for it in false religion and Catholicism. They had been searching for it perhaps in a bottle, perhaps through drugs, perhaps through a life of crime in the cartel. Been searching to fill that void that only salvation could fill in so many different ways. But whenever we share the wonderful news of salvation and they realize for the first time this is exactly what I need, it, it puts such a joy in my heart, but also puts a joy in their heart because they know that their salvation has been paid for. It's not something they have to pay for themselves, but God provided that for them. So that is the ministry the Lord has given me, um, working with national pastors. I've had the privilege of starting 10 churches like this. And so I'm very thankful for what the Lord's going to do moving forward. I'm currently still working in construction, you know, trying to get full time into the ministry, making that transition over because I realize that. Although I'm very thankful for what we have accomplished right now before I end this message, how many people are going to die in Mexico and go to hell? How many people are going to die in our community and go to hell? Just in the amount of time that we're sitting here in this church. Whenever you put it in that perspective, it's, it's heartbreaking to think that that individual is going to spend an eternity in separation from God, an eternity in torment. Hell is a real place. Hell is not something that we should speak lightly of because it is, it's a reality. And it's a reality for many many people. That's why it's important not only that I'm faithful to what God has called me to do in Mexico, but that we're faithful and that you're faithful to the ministry God has given you here in Seagrove. That we are doing everything that we can to be a light, to be a witness, because that's our responsibility. It isn't, the world is not going to reach the world. Why is that? Because just as our spirit bears witness with God's spirit, like we was talking about this morning, People are drawn to the things of the world, and the world is compelling to the people that are in the world. That is why it's important that we hold up the red flag. We tell them, don't go this direction. There is a Savior who is willing to die upon the cross for you that paid for your salvation. All you have to do is receive it. 
It's so salvation. Whenever it's laid out there, it's so simple. It's the easiest decision that you will ever make. I'm glad I made that decision on September 5th of 2009. September 5th will be 12 years since I got saved. I made a joke last year that I had to kick my shoes off to start counting because I made it to 11. Well, now I'm about to make it to 12. And I'm so thankful for what God has called me to do. But like we talked about this morning in Sunday school, my calling is unique to me. God has something that he wants you to do as well that's unique to you. And we need to be fixed. Excuse me. We need to be faithful to doing what God would have for us to do. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. And uh, I want to challenge our hearts. I want to encourage us through the message. And I want the Lord to, whenever we leave here, I want it to be very evident that he met with us. And I want us to leave with a desire to be used of God and to do the things of God. So in, in Acts chapter number 3, we'll begin reading in verse number 1. It says here, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, and asked alms of them that entered into the temple, whom, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter fastened his eyes upon him with John, and said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Let's go to the word to the Lord in prayer. Your gracious Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you for the privilege that it is to be here tonight. Lord, I ask that you'd please take me and use me, that you'd fill me up, Lord God, and use me as a mouthpiece to speak to the hearts of your people. I pray that even now we would search our hearts to remove anything that would hinder you from speaking unto us. We pray that you would challenge our hearts through the message. Please bless the reading of the word of God. It will be quick your praise for all it is that you will accomplish, for your precious and holy name we do pray. Amen. So here in this passage of Scripture, we see that Peter and John are making their way to the temple. Whenever they get to the temple, they find this lame man who is very familiar with the temple. The Bible says that he sat at the gate daily. And whenever we get down to through verses number 3 to verse number 6, we see their interaction with this man. And in verse number 7, Peter says something that I want to pull out and I want to, I want to preach to you all a little bit about. And it says here in verse number 7, I'm sorry, verse number 6, Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. For just a little while tonight, I want to preach on, but such as I have. But such as I have. It's a simple statement, but whenever we examine this passage of Scripture and how Peter and John was a blessing unto this man, it, and we apply that to our life so we can see how we can be used for the honor and glory of God and we can be used to make a difference in somebody else's life. So as a way of introduction, I want to look at Peter and John, and I kind of want to give a backstory of what brings them to this point. Number one, let's look at the time in which they lived. In Acts chapter number 2, verses number 1 through 4, we see the Holy Ghost sent. Here they are, they're sitting. We know the story well. They're sitting all in one accord. They are there, and then here comes the Holy Spirit as a cloven tongue like as fire and sat upon each of them. And we see in verse number 4 it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues and the Spirit as the Spirit gave them utterance. As we, in John chapter number 14, Jesus begins by saying, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Behold, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. This is a passage of Scripture that is supposed to be comforting to the disciples. Jesus is preparing them for what's about to happen. Jesus is about to ascend back into heaven. And whenever he does, the disciples are thinking to themselves, what are we going to do? What's going to be the comfort that we're going to have. He said, well, you can rest assured and have comfort in the fact that I'm coming again, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. The Bible says that in verse number 18 of that chapter. And what, what we see in this passage of Scripture is the prophecy of the Holy Ghost. Why well, I say the prophecy? Because that's something that is going to come. That's something that's still to be. And we see that come to pass here in Acts chapter number 2, whenever the Holy Ghost is sent. But not only is the Holy Ghost sent, but the Galileans begin to speak. Chapter number 2, verses number 5 through 13, 
they begin to speak in tongues. And every man, we have a list of the nations that are present here in verses number 9 all the way through verse number 11. And every man was able to hear in his own tongue. Well, instead of, you know, jumping to the conclusion, well, this is a miracle. We see in verse number 13 that they just mocked them and said that they were just a bunch of drunkards. Well, you know, I, I speak a little bit of Spanish. And there are times that I try to speak in Spanish to the people at my work, and they don't think I'm speaking Spanish. They probably think that I'm drunk because I'm messing up the language so bad. But that's not the case that was happening here in Acts chapter number 2. What they were doing, there was a miracle taking place. The Holy Spirit was giving them utterance and allowing them to be used, and every man was able to hear in his own tongue. So it was an exciting time that they were living in. Not only were the Galileans speaking, but we see the gospel was being spread. In verse number 14 through verse number 36. Then in verse number 37 through 40, we see the guilt of the sinner. After Peter preached this great message about salvation. Now, mind you, this is the first recorded message we have that after we have been ushered out of the time of the law into the age of grace. This is the first recorded message that we have. Peter is preaching to these people on the day of Pentecost, and they are hearing all of these things about not... And they're in the Old Testament, and through the Gospels, it was all, look to the cross, look to the cross. Now Peter's saying, look back to the cross. Look at what has been done. Today is the day of salvation, and Peter is preaching, and the Gospels being spread. Well, as a result of that, the sinner falls under conviction. In verse number 37, it says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They fell under conviction. We see that the sinner felt guilty for the sin that was in their life. They had heard the news of salvation, and they knew that it's what they stood in need of. So after we see the guilt of the sinner, in verse number 41 through verse number 47, we see growth among the saints. The Bible says that on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 souls were added to the church. That's, that's wonderful. 3,000 souls in one day added to the church. What a great revival. What an exciting time. Peter and John found themselves in being at the forefront and being in the center of what God was doing. So not only do we see the time in which they lived, but secondly, we see the truths by which they lived by. Number one, let's look at their love for the Savior. Peter announced his love for the Savior in John chapter number 21, verses number 15 through 17. Three times Jesus asked him, Peter, son of Jonas, thus thou love me. And two times Peter said, yes, Lord, I love you. But the third time Peter said, Lord, you know all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. He wanted to make sure there was no doubt. He said, Lord, I love you. Three times Peter denied him. But three times Peter made sure to make known the fact that he loved the Lord. Peter made known his love. Not just in his words, but he also made known his love through his actions. The day of Pentecost, he did not allow his past failures to dictate what he was going to do in his future. He did not allow those three denials to define what he was going to be and the life he was going to live for the Lord. He was still willing to be used of God, and he lived his life showing his love for the Savior. John showed his love in John chapter number 13, verse number 23, when we find him leaning on Jesus' bosom, so close that he could hear the heartbeat of God. John was so in love with the Savior that whenever all the disciples were in turmoil, Lord, is it me? Am I going to deny you? Lord, is it me? Am I going to betray you? John looks up and he says, I know it's one of these 11. Lord, which one is it? Because John knew it's not going to be me. I love the Lord. I have already decided I'm going to stick with him. I'm going to be faithful to him. So we see his love very evident as he was leaning on Jesus' bosom. So much so was his love for the Lord that whenever we come to John chapter number 19, verse number 25 through 27, Jesus gives John the task of taking care of his own mother. He says, John, behold thy mother. Mary, behold thy son. That's the responsibility that John was given. John was given that responsibility because he lived his life not only showing his love for the Lord, but secondly, we see their loyalty to the Savior. Not just their love for the Savior. Yes, it's important to love our Savior, to show that we love our Savior, but we need to be loyal to Him. We need to put Him in the forefront of our lives and in everything that we do. So this is the truths by which we live by. So that's where Peter and John find themselves. In chapter number 3, they are so excited about everything that's going on. They had just got done with the day of Pentecost. 3,000 souls added to the church. And the Bible says that they continue to add daily unto the church. So they were on fire for God, constantly seeking ways that they could be used of Him. But in chapter number 3, we have three characters, not just two. And this lame man that we're introduced to He's not having such a good time, just as Peter and John is. 
So thirdly, we see the trouble of this lame man. In verse number 2, we see the cripple's problem. In verse number 2, it says, And a certain lame man from his mother's womb was carried, whom was laid daily at the gate of the temple. In Acts chapter number 4, verse number 22, the Bible tells us that this man was above 40 years old. So let's just say it was 41 years old. 41 years he had been crippled. 41 years he had not been able to walk, not been able to move under his own strength. He could have been 48, he could have been 49, it could have been even more than that. But let's just say it was 41. Can you imagine for 41 years never standing on your own two feet? For 41 years having somebody to carry you to the gate of the temple and to be sat there said you can beg because you're unable to do it upon your own power. His family helped him, no doubt. Perhaps his friends helped him. Perhaps they were there, you know, loyal to him. They were a good friend to him and they helped him every way that they could. But the truth was, his family couldn't fix his ultimate need. His, fa his friends and his family, his religion couldn't help his ultimate need. He stood there, or rather laid there, completely helpless to save himself. So that's the problem that this cripple had. But not only do we see the cripple's problem, but secondly we see the cripple's petition. In verse number 3, "...whom seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms." He was searching for material gain. He had done this day in and day out. What was he asking? What was his petition? He was a searcher for material gain. Maybe a little money for some food. Maybe somebody would drop some food by form as they walked into the temple. That is what he was in search of. That was his petition. But was that material gain going to ultimately solve his problem? No. He was blind to his ultimate need. Would he have loved every single person that walked up steps like, hey, can you fix my lame, my lame legs? Can you help me to walk again? He didn't ask that question because to him and in his own strength and in the strength of the individuals that continue to pass him by, they were unable to help his ultimate need. So his petition was for material gain. But not only do we see his petition, thirdly, we see the cripple's proposition. In verse number 4 and verse number 5, and Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. So now, now Peter has given the cripple man an option. He's not dropping money into his little cup. He's not promising them food. He just looks upon the lame man and he says, Look upon us. Now the crippled man, the lame man, has an option. He can either say, well, I'm going to ask the next person that comes by for alms. I'm not going to waste my time with this man who seems who he has no idea what he's going to do. But the Bible says in verse number 5 that he gave heed unto them expecting to receive something of them. So now we see the obedience of this crippled man. He was given an option. Now in verse number 5 we see his obedience. He fastened his eyes upon Peter and John. And that is whenever we see Christ's power. In verse number 7 through verse or verse number 6 through verse number 10. And Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So here Peter is Peter has now grabbed the attention of this cripple man. And he said, I don't have silver, I don't have gold. I do not have the material things that you're in search of. He says, But what I do have, I'm willing to give thee. So he says, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up. And walk. That man was laying there expecting material gain. But instead of receiving material gain, that man walked away with the miracle. The Bible says in verse number 7, And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked, and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. No doubt whenever that man got there that morning, he was not thinking to himself he was going to be walking home that night. He was not thinking to himself, instead of getting a little bit of money like I usually do, today I'm going to receive strength back in my legs. I'm going to have strength in my ankle bones, and I'm going to be able to walk and leap through the temple. That's not what this man was expecting. This man was helpless and able to fix his own need. But whenever Peter fastened his eyes upon that man, and that man fastened his attention back on Peter, Peter said, I don't have silver, I don't have gold, I do not have the things that you are in pursuit of, but what I do have is I have Christ. And although you may think you need material gain, what I have to share with you is something much, much better. And so now let's take this and let's apply this to our lives. 
we live in a world that is constantly in pursuit of material gain, constantly in pursuit of some sort of position, constantly in pursuit of something that they feel will help their need. But their ultimate need, we know, is the need of salvation. Their ultimate need is one that they are helpless to obtain within their own strength, just like this crippled man. We may look at our lives and we may be able to say, how can I be used of the Lord? How can God use me to be able to make a difference in the life of somebody else? Never underestimate what you have. If you have Christ in your heart, you have something that you can give that individual that will help what they need. They may not even know that they need it, but whenever we are an example, whenever we are a witness, whenever we tell them of the wonderful news of salvation, and they hear that for the first time and they realize... I was in search of material gain. I was in search of something to fill this void that I had within me. But although I was not searching for it, I realized that this is ultimately what I need. The reason I, the, I wanted to preach not on, on but such as I have is because we need to realize that what we have is something that needs to be shared. It's something that we can be used to help others with. Just like Peter and John was willing to say, I don't have gold, I don't have silver, I cannot help you in that area. But what I can give you is what I have that is most precious to me. What we can give to others should be what is most precious unto us. Our salvation needs to be the foundation on which we build every aspect of our life. That's when our relationship with the Lord started. And from that moment of salvation up to present day, wherever you are in your life, if you look back, you're not going to be able to say you have obtained anything and you've made it upon your own strength. But as you look back, we're going to realize time after time after time again, it was God. It was God's help. It was His it was the relationship that we have in Him guiding us the way which only He can that has brought us ultimately to where we are. That's the gift that we have. That's what we have the responsibility to share. But such as I have, give I thee. The Lord has spoke to my heart, put this message upon my heart. Did He put it upon my heart to keep to myself? No. Whenever brother God put it upon Brother Poindexter's heart to have me in, is because He knew that this is what I had that I needed to share. Whenever He gives you the opportunity to be a witness. You have something that you have the responsibility to share. And what's the result of this? What is the ultimate outcome of what happened here in Acts chapter number 3? Because of Peter and John's obedience, whenever, whenever Christ healed this lame man, it affected so much more than just the lame man itself. We see that great wonders were worked among the sinners that were in this uh, passage of Scripture. In Acts chapter number 3, verses number 11 through 26, people began to be curious. They saw this man laying by the gate that morning. Now he was leaping and running around that afternoon. They began to wonder, how did this happen? Perhaps somebody was standing there that put some money in there as they was walking up the steps, and they got a little angry thinking, man, here I thought this man was crippled and that he was lame and now he's walking up leaping but most of the people we see that they recognize that this was this man that was helpless they realized that it was this man that was sitting beside that beautiful gate that is now leaping and they began to wonder what's all this about how did this happen and what the ultimate result was peter was able to preach among those people that were wondering and those people that began begin to that began to be curious over what was taking place. And we see in chapter number four, verse number four, it says, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of men was about five thousand. So here, the day of Pentecost, three thousand people were saved. Now we get to chapter number four, and as a result of this lame man being killed, five thousand people are saved. Five thousand people believed because they knew that this man was helpless within his own strength, but somehow, miraculously, he was healed. Whenever their curiosity began to rise up within them, and they began to investigate to see what was going on, Peter was able to say, Hey, this man, you may have given him a little bit of material gain, but Christ was able to heal him, was able to fix his ultimate need. And people, other sinners, were able to benefit as a result of that. As we live our lives, we may think that handing out a gospel tract might not do any good. But it might be that gospel tract that God uses to lead somebody to the Lord later on that you may not ever even get to meet. You may not know the fruit of what you have done, but because you was obedient to the Lord, because you gave of what you had, 
Christ was willing to use that. There's a man in Mexico, and he was given a gospel tract, and he read it, and he accepted Christ as a Savior. I ran into him a few years later, and he began sharing his testimony, and he pulled out that gospel tract out of his suit coat, and he flipped it over, and on the back was 75 names. You couldn't even read that gospel tract anymore because of all the signatures, but he had memorized that tract. And he, everywhere he would go, he would say, this track is saved my life. Let me tell you what it said. And he began to walk him through the process of salvation. He began to walk him through saying, hey, you have believed in a religion that says you give and you be good. And maybe one day you can make it to heaven. He said, no, 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 that's not the truth. Whenever Jesus Christ died upon the cross of Calvary, whenever he shed his blood for the sins of the whole world, he did it for you. And 75 names were written on the back of that one gospel track that that man used to lead all those people to the Lord. Why? Because all he had was that track. But of such as he had, he was willing to give to one person. Then he gave it to another person. Then another, and then another. And as a result, 75 people wrote their names on the back of that track because they had accepted Christ as their Savior as a result of that man's testimony. So we see that there is great wonder among the sinners. But secondly, we see the gospel witness was able to be brought before the temple. The scribes and the Pharisees, they didn't like what was going on. So what did they do? You read through chapter number 4. They took Peter, they took John, they held him overnight. And then the next day, they brought him before the leaders, before the high priests. And they told him, they said, I don't want you preaching anymore. Don't preach. Don't spread the wonderful news of salvation. Don't mention Jesus again. And they told him, they said, you can tell us not to do that. said, but first chance we're going to get, we're going to be a witness. We're going to continue to spread the wonderful news of salvation because that's what God has given us to spread to others. So now the gospel has reached the highest court within the city, has now reached the top of the top, how, however far you can get within that temple. Now the gospel had been able to be spread. Did they receive the gospel? Did they receive Christ? No. But the, the Bible tells me that one day whenever they stand before God, they're going to look back and they're going to say, you know, Peter and John, they told us. They told us that Christ was the way. And here we were, not willing to accept that. Here we were, not, not willing to be able to say, this is the truth. This is what we stand in need of. And as a result of that, you know, one, one day they're going to have to answer for that because they were not willing to accept that. They're, whenever we share, not everybody is going to receive the gospel. Not everybody is going to be willing to to step out by faith and put their faith in Jesus. But should that stop us from being the witness that we should be? Should that stop us from giving of what God has given to us and to being the example that we ought to be? Absolutely not. The Lord has told us not to live in the spirit of fear, not to shy away from the things that He will call us to do because He will give us the resources necessary to be able to fulfill and to be able to accomplish the task that He has given us. But lastly, not only do we see that there is great wonder among the sinners, that the gospel witness within the temple, but we also see that glory and honor was given to God. That lame man didn't get up and start running through the temple thanking Peter and John and giving praise to Peter and John for what they had done. The sinners did not say, hey, Peter and John, what can you do for us? What had happened was because Peter and John did it in the right spirit and they did it in the right way, that, that lame man got up and he began praising God throughout that temple. Whenever the sinners came to Peter and John and said, will you tell us about what this man is talking about? The wonder that they had pointed them to Christ. It didn't point them to Peter. It didn't point them to John. It pointed them to ultimately what they needed, and that was Christ. As we serve Him, as we do for Him what we have been called to do, whenever it's done in the right spirit, it will not bring glory to us. It will not cause us to be seen. It will not cause us to be glorified, but it will cause God to be put in the forefront of our lives and also in the forefront and be edified to where he is what's seen. Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 16. We talked about this morning in Sunday school. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's our responsibility. That is, that's not a suggestion. It wasn't written in there, if you want to, let your light so shine before men. It makes it very clear. Let your light so shine before men. That is a responsibility that we have been given and a responsibility we are to be faithful to. Never shy down to 
give others of what we have because what we have will make an everlasting impact upon their lives and being faithful to it will make an everlasting impact upon our lives as well.